This is a production of Cornell University. Now, the talk today is really uh, what I call my book talk. And uh, this first slide here is, uh, I took this, it's not Photoshopped or anything like that. This is a picture of Detroit. And um, it's really a picture of those trees that surround this, uh, this dump area. And those, of course, are Ilanthus trees, the tree of heaven. And really what this talk is about is what constitutes nature in, a, in an urban context? What does it mean when we talk about nature in the city? And uh, so with that introduction, um, I'm gonna just sort of jump right in. And as Nina mentioned, the, the second edition of my book, The Wild Urban Plants of the Northeast, uh, published by Cornell University, uh, press that came out uh, in 2020. The first edition came out in 2010. And, you know, if you look, it covers 267 species, so that's an increase of about 20% over the first edition. But roughly a third of them are native to uh, North or uh, Central America. 44% uh, come from Europe, Central Asia. 13% from East Asia, that would be China, Japan, and Korea. 8% to Eurasia and North America, and 1% to Africa. So, you know, the take home message here is the vegetation that grows spontaneously in our cities, it's as cosmopolitan as its human population. And, uh, you know, what's interesting is if you look at sort of how this has changed, there's not that much data about sort of this, how these, um, the non-native species numbers have changed over time, but one source is a famous book, Asa Gray's Manual of Botany. Uh, the first edition came out in 1856, and at that point, roughly 10% of the species that grew spontaneously in the Northeast um, were non-native species. By 1890, that figure was up to about 15%, 1908, 16%, uh, and the last edition of Gray's Manual came out in 1950, when it was up to roughly 20%. So over the period of about 100 years, the uh, number of non-native species effectively doubled. And since uh, the 1950s, now we don't necessarily break up the flora in those, those terms. It's really something that's looked at state by state. And so for uh, various northeastern states, the percentage of non-native species now varies from 24 to 35 percent. I think Massachusetts has the highest percentage of non-native species. So this is uh, the presence of non-native species in our uh, flora is, uh, you know, moving target. This is definitely a trend and it's not uh, going down. In fact, it's increasing all the time. And what's really interesting is that, and I just pulled this chart off of the internet, but if you look at the you know, racial and ethnic composition of the city of Boston and how that's changed over the last 70 years, you see that, you know, cities are all about flux. There's no uh, stability. And, you know, with the human population, the flux uh, relates to socioeconomic uh, conditions as they change and, uh, you know, one ethnic group replaces another in any given neighborhood. And, we accept this as part of the ecology of cities. And with the vegetation, the uh, composition of the vegetation reflects changing environmental conditions. So it's really a parallel situation. And we accept you know, the diversity of the human population in cities is a good thing. But when it comes to the vegetation, uh, we, we say, oh my God, it's you know, all these non-natives, that's terrible. We have to do something about it. But in fact, the vegetation, the ecology of the city is really just a reflection of uh, the fact that cities exist for the, you know, betterment of uh, the human population. And, you know, one of the first things you, you have to do when you study urban ecology, you have to define what you mean by urban. So in a traditional definition of 500 people per square mile, this is what, you know, the Northeast looks like. And you see, when we talk about urbanization, we're not talking about sidewalk cracks or, you know, little patches. We're talking about a major, uh, you know, force of transforming the landscape on a large, large scale. So urbanization, and it's increasing all the time as a higher and higher percentage of the human population moves from the countryside into these urban areas. So urbanization is 
you know, uh, essentially uh, is becoming a geological force. And you know, if you look at, you know, a, a typical modern city, I don't know if you, how many people recognize this is uh, actually Los Angeles. You can see on the right-hand side that trough there with water running through it. That's the famous LA River. And of course, you can talk about um, you know, what vegetation used to grow in uh, the city of Los Angeles as a historical uh, fact, but the concept of what is native to LA as it currently exists is a, it's a ludicrous question when you take this, the bird's eye view of the city because nothing is native to the city of Los Angeles as it exists today. And the fact that people still talk about, you know, the native vegetation of cities as though it were something that, you know, was relevant other than as a historical, uh, from a historical perspective, struck, strikes me as a, sort of a, a crazy idea, particularly when you talk about restoring the native uh, vegetation of the city. And looking again at cities as, you know, ecological entities, they have uh, very uh, specific characteristics that distinguish them, them from the surrounding non-urban areas, not the least of which is, as everyone is familiar with, obviously the urban heat island effect. And along the horizontal axis you have there, the size of the city, population going up to 10 million, and then on the vertical axis, the maximum urban heat island. So that's the difference between an urbanized area and a non-urban or rural area, more or less at the same latitude. And as the human city gets bigger, this difference, which is, that's in centigrade, so 12 degrees centigrade when you're up for around a million people, that's roughly 21 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's on a warm summer night when those temperature differentials are the greatest. But clearly, um, you know, cities are much warmer than the surrounding countryside. And this is actually an important, uh, you know, observation because it means that if you are interested in studying climate change effects, you can see them in the urban areas much more readily than you can in non-urban areas because the cities have already warmed up to the extent that's projected for future uh, climate change on a, on a, in non-urban areas. Uh, other factors that, you know, just to make the same point, if you, on the left-hand side, that's the growing season length for the city of Boston, and then on the right-hand side, the land surface temperatures. So you can see that, you know, in the Boston metropolitan area, there's a good five to 10 days uh, difference in when, you know, the first frost comes strictly as a result of urbanization and the plants, this is a, you know, not something that's happened, you know, suddenly it's been going on for, you know, well over a hundred years and the plants are well aware of these changes and this is what they respond to. So, you know, adaptation to climate change, we keep talking about climate change as something that's, you know, about to happen or going to happen, but in point of fact, climate change has been going on for a, quite a long time and the vegetation has already adapted to these changing conditions. Now, the other thing is I've talked about the definition of urbanization, and I apologize for the complexity of this graph, but it's kind of, it's, it's really important. This is a map, again, I apologize for showing you Boston and not uh, Ithaca, but there's Boston in the very center, and then it's surrounded by the 95 Beltway. Now, the zero point on the horizontal axis, that's downtown Boston, and 100 kilometers to the west represents the Harvard Forest in Petersham, Massachusetts, a very rural where I was, used to work. And, you know, when you get about 19 kilometers outside of Boston, you cross 95, and each dot there represents a 100 uh, meter square plot, and it, uh, on the vertical axis, it measures the amount of impervious surface in that 100 meter square plot. And as you can see that all the sample uh, plots inside the 95 Beltway were essentially 30% or more impervious surface. And then once you crossed over 95, then basically everything is, you know, less than 25% impervious surface, except for one dot right there that represents the, you know, the city of Fitchburg. But why this is important is this means that you can also define urbanization uh, by the extent of impervious surface. And when you have 30% or more impervious surface in a given area, you have an urbanized uh, situation. And if it's less than 30%, then 
you can consider that non-urban. So this is a way of talking about urbanization independent of the human population. So from this perspective, it turns out that many of our suburbs are actually, from a biological point of view, uh, urbanized. And the, the reason that, you know, impervious surface works is that, you know, if you've worked at all with plants, you know that when you change the drainage patterns on a site, you automatically change the vegetation. So uh, vegetation it responds incredibly closely to drainage patterns and impervious surface is, you know, one of the most effective ways of changing drainage across a site. And when you have more than 30% uh, impervious surface, then you essentially have an urbanized condition. So from a plant perspective or biological perspective, I should say, I like to define urbanization as, you know, 30% <laughs> or more uh, impervious surface. And I like to analogize urbanization with glaciation. And of course, the uh, heavy equipment is the, uh, the urban glacier. And, uh, you know, just like uh, real glaciers, uh, the urban glacier leaves compacted glacial till in its wake. And, you know, this is what it looks like after construction and they call in the landscape crews. They put uh, two inches of topsoil on there and sow grass. And, you know, you're, you're at the prime state of primary succession, just like you would have after uh, the receding of the glaciers. And, you know, for again, for Boston, the urban glacier has expanded the original land area of Boston by 17%. So the uh, sort of orange color represents the original topography of Boston. The beige represents parts of Boston that were filled prior to 1880 and the blue uh, filled after 1880. So then the question becomes, well, let me, before I go into that, uh, what's interesting, so this is, you know, this is the history of Boston. And I, I put this slide in here because it's really important. In 1913, FEMA issued a high risk uh, for sea level rise for flooding. And, you know, everything bordered in red uh, is going to be okay on one side of it. If it's, you know, the, the bluish color and if it's the um, pinkish color, that's in danger of flooding. And you can see that it corresponds almost exactly to the areas that have been filled in. And so if you're on the original topography of Boston, you're fine, but if you're, you know, if your property's on the filled area, you've got real trouble. Now, when this map came off, came out in 1913, the real estate developers had a complete fit because they thought that this would depress the property values. So FEMA actually pulled the map but it was, it was really too late. The information got out there. But, uh, you know, what's really interesting is this is actually, uh, you know, sea level rise represents a restoration, if you will, of the original topography. Now, from a biological point of view, the question arises, what's the, na what's the native vegetation of fill soils, given that almost 20% of Boston is built on fill? And, uh, you know, you realize, of course, that's a, you know, kind of an absurd question. But, you know, native soils have very specific characteristics, layered, distinct loans of biological activity, typically thin and porous, high organic matter content, low nutrient content, and high levels of biological activity and cycling, whereas fill soils, no natural structure, heavy and contaminated, low organic matter content, high nutrient content, low levels of biological activity, and often chemically contaminated. So, you know, these, uh, you know, this, the, the plants, you can't, there's nothing to restore. These fill soils support a very different palette of plants than the native soils. And you can't talk about restoring native ecosystems unless you have some semblance of the original native soil intact to work with. But when you uh, are working on fill soils, you can't create a native ecosystem. All you can do is create what's called a novel ecosystem. And, you know, there are other factors that, you know, uh, you know affect the vegetation at the, at the urban scale. Road salt, you know, we spread road salt here in Boston like there's no tomorrow. Nobody wants to compromise public safety for the sake of a few plants. But very few people are aware of the fact that, you know, with just the mere act of spreading salt on the ground, it increases soil compaction, decreases water availability, reduces cation exchange, the ability of plants to pick up nutrients, and uh, elevates soil pH. And 
as I said earlier, the plants know exactly what's going on and have already adapted. So one of our most common urban plants, mugwort, Artemisia vulgaris, uh, comes from Europe, from limestone so soils in Europe, and is highly tolerant of salt and soil compaction and does extremely well in the urban conditions. And along our highways, which are salted to within an inch of their life, uh, the ailanthus tree does so well because of its uh, high level of salt tolerance. What's interesting though is that it's not just the non-native species that are responding to changing environmental condition, but a number of our native species have also responded. So seaside goldenrod that used to be confined strictly to coastal areas has moved inland from Boston almost to Sturbridge, which is about you know, Sturbridge, Massachusetts along the Mass Pike which is uh, close to 50 miles. And that's all happened within the last 30 or 40 years. And um, groundsel bush, which is a baccarus, that's moved up from New Jersey. It used to be uh, very uncommon uh, in Massachusetts, but now uh, the roadside ditches along our, our interstate uh, are now filling up with the groundsel bush the way uh, it used to be in New Jersey. So it's not just the uh, non-native invasive species that are uh, taking advantage of this, but a number of native species also know what's happening and are adapting. Now, uh, the other thing that is uh, clearly uh, a, a factor, particularly in urban environments, is, you know, when you ever burn fossil fuels, that puts uh, nitrogen and sulfur compounds into the air, and then they come back down either under wet or dry conditions, and we used to call that, you know, acid rain, but um, that's what it still is actually. But you know, when these compounds come down, they lower the soil pH, acidify the soil uh, through, you know, by increasing nitrogen and sulfur content. And um, this has been going on for, a, you know, a very long time. And it's a result of the burning of fossil fuels. All fossil fuels uh, result in ultimately the deposition of nitrogen and sulfur compounds. But at the local level, the acid precipitation, it interacts with any limestone structure, any concrete that leaches the calcium out of the concrete and it creates a higher pH um, sort of microclimate in the vicinity of these concrete structures. So the acid conditions, the acid precipitation actually creates uh, high pH uh, environments in the urban uh, in cities, basically. Now this slide uh, done by a colleague of mine, a friend, good friend um, from Boston University. This was part of his PhD thesis. This is nitrogen deposition Boston. This is kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year. And my house, which is one of his research sites right here in Watertown, Massachusetts, was 11 pounds, I should say 11 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare was the rate. So that averages out to roughly pounds per acre. So we can call that roughly 10 pounds per acre of nitrogen. It's coming out of the sky uh, on an annual basis uh, in the Boston metropolitan area. This is an astounding number. And this has been going on. This is not a new phenomenon. This has been going on for as long as we've been burning fossil fuels. So well over a hundred years. Uh, the good news is, of course, is that, you know, you can stop fertilizing your lawn because that's, a, that's an awful lot of nitrogen that's raining down from the sky. Uh, the bad news is, of course, is this completely changes ecological conditions and those plants that can tolerate those higher levels of nitrogen will do well. And those species, a lot of our native species, they don't know what to do when confronted with this much nitrogen and they are unable to take advantage of it. So these are, you know, and most of this is, uh, the source of this is, it, you can fingerprint it, it comes from automobiles. And as you move to the west from Boston, it's not a, you know, values of nitrogen deposition are much higher in the cities than they are in Peter Sam, but there's, it's not a nice a linear, um, relationship. It's, it's more complicated than that. It really depends on how close you are to a major highway uh, in terms of, you know, where that deposition number is. Uh, so nitrogen deposition is much higher in cities and non-urban areas, but it's not a, a nice linear uh, relationship. Now, uh, the question of how does vegetation respond to this is a question that um, 
ecologists have thought about for a long time. And this is a study that came out of Cornell University almost 20 years ago now. And they looked at uh, populous deltoides and they actually you know, got the same soils. They planted populous in, I think, Ithaca and then New York City. And they you know, were surprised to find that the trees uh, in New York City grew much better than they did in Ithaca. And it took them a long time to figure it out. Some of it was due to the increased nitrogen deposition. Some of it increased temperature. But in, in the case of this study, uh, they determined that it was the amount of ozone uh, was more responsible, that ozone is produced in the upper atmosphere, in above urban areas, but then uh, wind uh, moves it to uh, non-urban areas. So ozone levels are actually higher in many cases in the areas surrounding uh, you know, the city than in the city itself. So the trees did much better in uh, Manhattan than they did in uh, New Jersey, uh, partly because of nitrogen, but mainly because of ozone. Now, uh, when I was working at the Arboretum, we did a little experiment. I mean, it took almost 10 years basically to do it, but uh, people still don't forgive me for doing this. We did a, uh, a logging experiment at the Arnold Arboretum, which people were just horrified at, but we had a stand of hemlock trees. It was a native stand essentially that was uh, being destroyed by uh, hemlock woolly adelgid infestation. So rather than just watch the trees all die, it's a 24 acre site, we decided we'd do a comparative study with my colleagues at the Harvard Forest and we would cut uh, a patch of these hemlock trees and look at regeneration in the urban area, that would be the Arnold Arboretum versus uh, the same experiment done at the Harvard Forest, 100 kilometers away. So we did the logging using a crane, a very high-end logging operation uh, at the Arnold Arboretum in the middle of uh, you know, to actually towards the end of winter uh, when they would be doing it at the Harvard Forest as well. And this is the black birch. This is natural regener regeneration of Betula lenta 10 years after the cutting of Hemlock Hill at the Arnold Arboretum. It was, the trees were um, over 30 feet tall, which is just like black birch is not supposed to be able to grow. Uh, that fast if you look at the uh, data in the silvicultural uh, literature. And what we found basically is that, you know, we haven't published this study yet, we're still working on it, but that when you compare the relatively undisturbed urban soils at the Arboretum, this was a natural area, versus the, royal, or the rural soils at the Harbor Forest, the soils at the Arboretum were more compacted, more acidic, lower carbon to nitrogen ratio, very high levels of nitrogen, nitrogen cycling. And you can see that right here on this graph here. Hemlock Hill, the nitrogen was over uh, 2000, uh, you know, in the captured in the resin bags. That's, I don't know if that's parts per million, but, and in the Sims track of the Harvard Forest is close to zero. Soil pH, again, uh, Hemlock Hill, it was three, a Sims track, Sims track, it was, um, more like uh, 4.2 almost. So, uh, and the final conclusion was after 10 years, the natural regeneration of black birch at the Arboretum was significantly more abundant and larger than at the Harvard Forest. And undoubtedly, as a result of uh, the higher nitrogen uh, soil content and the warmer winters. It's difficult to separate those two things apart, but those seem to be the two factors that explain the difference in growth and sort of putting this together, you know, almost every study I've looked at when they're comparing urban and uh, non-urban area tree growth, find that the trees in the urban area actually do better than the trees growing in non-urban areas. And you can see that if you look at the various factors, increased nitrogen deposition, uh, that has positive effects at first. Now you can have too much nitrogen that becomes negative. Uh, soil pH, increased growing season temperatures, CO2 levels, increased growing season length, warmer winter temperatures, impervious surface, soil compaction. So the, these factors all impact tree growth. And what's interesting is many of them actually are favorable uh, for the growth of trees in urban areas. But again, if you go too far uh, down that line, it, it then has a, it begins to be unfavorable. So this is, uh, you know, really, really interesting. And it strikes a lot of people as counterintuitive that trees actually grow better in the urban environment 
than the non-urban environment, but the data suggests um, no, actually they do they do very trees do very well in cities. Uh, and fragmentation, of course, is another uh, characteristic of the urban environment. Uh, here, this is in Los Angeles, the Arroyo Seco Parkway. The one through the tunnel on the left-hand side was the original one. That was, imagine that four lanes that was both into and out of the city. And within about 20 years, it wasn't big enough. So they built the other uh, highway elevated there, just sort of <laughs> went right through the middle of the mountain and completely uh, fragmented the landscape. And, you know, another word for fragmentation, of course, is just suburban sprawl. And, you know, here's the map for 50 years of uh, development in, in Massachusetts. I'm sure it's the same for New York State. It's been a tremendous increase in the development, both urban and non-urban, over the past 50 years, which results in the total fragmentation of the landscape. And what's really interesting is we, you know, you think about suburbanization and suburban sprawl as, you know, building these, these housing developments. And that it was true in the 1950s and 60s. But the way um, suburbanization seems to be happening these days is that, you know, they're punching holes in the middle of intact forests and putting houses in with long driveways, which that process is known as perforation. And, uh, you know, you start by perforating the landscape and then over time, uh, the perforations come together and lead to fragmentation. But it used to be using uh, satellite imagery when you looked at a perforated landscape, it looked as though it were an intact forest. But uh, now with more sophisticated, more detailed um, satellite imagery, we can now recognize these perforated landscapes as essentially no longer intact forests. And it turns out that uh, the Northeast is losing its forest cover uh, at a uh, much faster rate than people uh, assumed was happening because we weren't counting this perforation process as part of um, the fragmentation uh, process. So again, this is, uh, this is happening. It's happening on a large scale and it's really having an impact on all of our uh, native ecosystems. The thing about fragmentation is that it creates, um, you know, edges. Uh, and, you know, where you have an edge, um, you, you know, you have different types of habitats coming together. And people who study invasive species, if you're trying to correlate the occurrence of invasive species with some uh, environmental factor, and you, you know, Look at a lot of different factors. The one factor that explains uh, the most about the distribution, the occurrence of invasive species on any landscape is proximity to the nearest road. And so the you know, roadways with their disturbed edges, disturbed by the application of road salt and mowing and so on and so forth, uh, are typically uh, dominated by non-native species as a result of all that disturbance. And then from those disturbed edges, this plant will move into uh, the surrounding forests. And similarly, you know, the rivers, many of our cities are built along rivers, and rivers also experience high levels of disturbance due to fluctuations in the water level. And as a result of this disturbance, albeit a natural disturbance, uh, you typically have a high percentage of non-native species dominating these uh, river bottomlands uh, in urban areas because uh, they're adapted to uh, the, the, you know, it's either extremely dry in the middle of summer and then at flood stage in spring. And you have to be a very adaptable plant to be able to uh, survive those extremes of environmental conditions. And now what's interesting about these uh, fragmentation is that, you know, you think about transportation corridors, railroad tracks, and highways. And traditionally, an ecologist would look at, at these as uh, barriers to the migration of, you know, animal species. And, you know, they build these overpasses out in the far west to help animals uh, cross these barriers. But what's interesting is in an urban context, these um, barriers can also be corridors. And this is actually the flip side of the coin is that every barrier is actually also a corridor. So, you know, this uh, train track here, this is in Boston, the purple line, it uh, comes up from the south, uh, goes and runs on its way into the Forest Hill subway station. It runs right into the Arnold Arboretum. And once those trains stop running around midnight, 
that's free, that's, that's open to animal access. And so the animals start tr moving up and down those train tracks and, you know, they get to the Arnold Arboretum that way and they've, you know, they've arrived at paradise as far as they're concerned. So these uh, transportation corridors after, you know, after midnight uh, actually serve as uh, very important uh, pathways for wildlife to enter and leave the urban environment. So this is a good example of, you know, how urban ecology works in ways that's different from the ecology in the surrounding non-urban areas. Now, and getting back to the vegetation for a minute, you know, the, the plants that essentially grow well and do well in the cities, like I mentioned Ilanthus on my very first slide there, um, here it is on the left-hand side, that's growing on the limestone hills around Beijing. There it is on the Great Wall. And on the right-hand side is, you know, the same tree growing in exactly the same conditions, the Great Wall uh, near the Arnold Arboretum, essentially. And so I call this pre-adaptation. In other words, the plants that do well in the urban environment come from uh, areas in nature that resemble the habitats that they uh, come from. And so they're, they're not adapted so much to the urban environment as pre-adapted. They come from areas uh, in nature that resemble those you find in the city. So, you know, what is a, you know, crumbling brick building uh, from a tree's perspective, except, uh, you know, it's a limestone cliff, basically. Um, and, you know, European ecologists who are light years ahead of uh, American ecologists in the study of urban environments uh, have really, based on uh, looking at detailed analysis of vegetation over 30 cities scattered across Europe, that urbanization favors species, that would be plants that grow well in soils that are relatively fertile, dry, sunny, and alkaline. So that's your profile of your typical urban plant because those are the types of soil conditions that dominate the urban environment. Now, this explains roughly about 60% of the plants that grow in the, spontaneously in cities fit this profile. And obviously there's some that you know, do not, but it, it does explain uh, the majority of those plants that grow in urban environments. So that's really, this is really important information because this, tells you uh, a lot about the nature of the urban environment. So pre-adaptation, if you begin to look at this, is what types of habitats in nature do urban plants come from? Obviously, limestone adapted plants are tolerant of de-icing salts and concrete rubble. Tap-rooted herbs from rocky outcrops grow well in sidewalk cracks. Disturbance adapted early successional trees have a strong capacity to sprout back following repeated cutting and weed whacking. Floodplain trees perform well on urban streets with high light and compacted uh, soils. Winter annuals that germinate in the fall and flower in the spring are more robust with uh, warmer, shorter winters. This is amazing because I've just watched, you know, over the past 20 years, the number of and the, the abundance of winter annuals and their size in the spring when they uh, flower and seed is really changing. And that's one life form that is really a, a big winner when it comes to climate change. Nitrophilic annuals, including many agricultural weeds, respond well to uh, atmospheric nitrogen deposition. Day length and sensitive plants that leaf out early in spring and hold their leaves into the fall. Uh, have a much longer growing season than, you know, our native uh, vegetation that's much more dependent on or responsive, I should say, to day length than it is to temperature. And warm temperate species from southern latitudes that flourish in the heat island warmth of northern cities. So these are, you know, if you begin to sort of look at what plants do well in the urban environment, these are the types of habitats in nature where they come from. Now, before I get into the next section of my talk, I have a very simple taxonomy of urban landscapes. You'll like this because it's, you know, it's really very basic. You know, you have your unmanaged natural urban landscapes. So these would be, you know, uh, land dominated by a mix of native and non-native species on light or moderately disturbed soil. So they might still have some semblance of the native soils intact. And of course, they require low to medium uh, maintenance. Then you have your managed urban landscapes. These would be parks, ball fields, cemeteries, dominated by cultivated plants, rich, highly modified soils, and of course, medium to high maintenance requirements. And then 
what I'm going to talk about for the remainder of this is the ruderal uh, or abandoned urban landscapes, post-industrial land, vacant lots, spontaneous vegetation on compacted or fill soils, and of course, uh, highly sustainable because they have zero to low maintenance requirements. So this is a, just a very simple way of categorizing urban vegetation in response to soil type and uh, the maintenance regime. And if you, you know, if you want to study urban vegetation, uh, the Rust Belt uh, area of the, the United States is one of the best places, and Detroit is sort of the poster child for uh, the Rust Belt. Um, you know, the, because abandonment uh, in Detroit is, you know, began in the 19, actually began in the 50s, but really, really accelerated in the 1960s, and, you know, Detroit has lost over 40% of um, uh, a huge percentage of its, po actually 60% of its population has been it's, since the 1950. So it's from a sociological point of view, the situation in Detroit is a catastrophe. They, they need more jobs, they need work. Uh, but from a botanical point of view, it's really an interesting place to go because the process of abandonment has been going on for you know, uh, upwards of 60 or 70 years now. So you get to see what happens over time when portions of the city have been abandoned and left to nature. And this is not something you kind of find in Boston or New York, uh, you know, these prosperous cities where land, vacant land doesn't sit for more than five or 10 years because it's worth so much. So in Detroit, basically, the land has lost uh, its its value. And, you know, from a design point of view, the question, well, what, what do you do with land when it's lost its value? So this graph shows you, you know, 40% of uh, Detroit is abandoned. Some of that is land, some of it's buildings, and it's a pretty uh, extreme situation. And, you know, as I said, what's interesting about it is you actually have these, you know, cosmopolitan forests have emerged. I, you know, I don't like, you know, I, a lot of these plants that I study, you know, suffer from image problems. They're called invasive, non-native. They're all these derogatory terms. So I decided to come up with a sort of a, I tried to improve the image a little bit by referring to it as cosmopolitan vegetation. So here's your typical cosmopolitan forest growing up in Detroit. But, you know, when you go into some of these neighborhoods, maybe only one or two of the original houses are still standing. And um, it's, you, you know, you feel like you're in the middle of the countryside, basically. It's really extraordinary. The vegetation has taken over a lot of the buildings. Like there's obviously a, a wetland up there on the second floor where the willow is growing. Or, you know, this is the loading dock wetland where the drainage no longer works and the phragmitis has come in. And when I was there in the spring, the red-winged blackbirds were in there singing. And it was just a, you know, this is an urban wetland, uh, no doubt about it. So what's happening in our cities is really, you know, we're watching the succession process. What happens to urban infrastructure when it's abandoned? And how, what's the process that vegetation sort of recolonizes the urban environment? And I think it's a, you know, this is the modern version of old field succession that um, a lot of people studied uh, way back when. And, you know, once you begin looking at the urban environment from this perspective, you realize that fence lines are, you know, safe sites for a seedling establishment because the mowers can't get to them and there's always a, a seam there where the fence is. It allows seedlings to establish. And of course, this is the ultimate manifestation of a fence as a safe site. The maintenance crews would love to get rid of this American elm, but it's enmeshed in the chain link fence and there's nothing that can be done about it. And of course, the other thing that's characteristic at, at the micro scale is wherever you have different types of paving material coming together, you have a seam forming because the materials expand and contract at differential, differentially in response to temperatures. And because of that, these seams form and the plants always are able to find those seams and insert themselves into it. And so uh, this is the trifecta uh, of uh, construction material. You've got blacktop, granite, and concrete. Uh, coming together, and uh, that offers unlimited opportunities for plants. Or, 
you know, I've showed this slide before, but it's, I, you know, I just love it because when I took the picture, I didn't know, it just looked weird to me and I took the picture, but if you look at it closely, you see that the grass is only growing on the short end of the brick and not the long end. And you might look at this picture and say, did a landscape architect plant this? What's going on? But if you realize that masonry is sort of like metal, it expands or contracts in proportion to its length, that the gap that forms, uh, you know, along the short end of the brick is going to be just a little bit wider than the gap that forms in the, uh, on the other side of the brick. And that difference is just enough to allow the seeds of this native uh, species to get in there and germinate. So this is, you know, this is the kind of thing that's happening all over the urban environment. And, you know, it's real ecology, but somehow or other, it, it, we don't count it as ecology, or this is another example. You turn the air conditioner on in June, uh, you get the condensation. That's the beginning of the rainy season as far as the carpet weed is concerned. We turn the air conditioner off in September. That's the onset of the, the dry season. Uh, the, seed, the, the plant matures its seeds. It's an annual plant. It lays them down, disappears totally. And then when we turn the air conditioner back on in June, June they germinate and the whole cycle begins again. So. You know, there's real ecology happening in the urban environment. You just have to, uh, you know, train your eye to recognize it. Um, and this is, uh, you know, I've used the term now novel ecosystems a couple of times, but it really refers to, you know, an ecosystem that develops in response to changing environmental conditions that allow the entry of new species and lead to the rearrangement of existing species. And Essentially, you know, back in the old days, you had forest ecosystems. If they were cut uh, or turned into farms, they, you know, and then abandoned, they would revert back to forest. But now, if a forest ecosystem is converted to a suburb or a city, and then it's abandoned, it doesn't go back to being a forested ecosystem. It essentially becomes a novel ecosystem. So what happens, you know, what we're seeing now are these hard landscape transformations involving paving and construction. And those hard transformations, when they revert to nature, they turn into these novel ecosystems, whereas soft uh, transformations associated with agriculture and logging, they will revert back to a forested ecosystem ecosystem. So these novel urban ecosystems have very specific characteristics, interacting forces, urbanization, globalization, and climate warming to stabilize native ecosystems and lead to the spread of opportunistic species. That's a word I like, both native and non-native. Water, air, ground pollution impacts soil chemistry, which impacts microbial activity, which impacts nutrient cycling, and vegetation patterns. So the vegetation is like the icing on the cake. If you know, it's all about the soil. That's really, you know, if there's one take home message you have from this talk, it's really the, the you know, everything we do in the environment ends up essentially in the soil and the soil is, you know, determines vegetation patterns. Habitat fragmentation creates sunny edges, which are dominated by fast growing disturbance and you know, the good news is, is that, you know, this is, this is what is happening. You know, these are these novel ecosystems of what are happening on a worldwide basis associated with all the changes. And as I say, the good news is, is that the vegetation has already adapted to these changing conditions. So we as people, we still may be arguing about it from a political perspective, but uh, the plants are not paying any attention to our little uh, political debates, they've just gone ahead and adapted to the changing world. In that sense, uh, you know, I, I subtitled my book, The Flora of the Future, because it really represents, these are the plants that are going to flourish under the projected changes that are going to be happening to our planet over the next, you know, 20 years or so. And, you know, if you've come with me this far on this journey, uh, not only do I assert that, you know, these non-native species are not bad, I would say that in an urban context, many of them are actually quite positive in terms of the ecosystem services that they provide. I won't go through this list, you can just look at it and, you know, uh, you know, if you're looking at if a tree creates shade, it's going to lower temperatures. It really doesn't matter where that plant is from. All plants sequester carbon. Some are 
more effective than others. And, you know, Atlantis sequesters carbon, you know, and nobody has to, you know, plant it or take care of it. So, you know, that's highly efficient because there's no uh, costs associated with its care and maintenance. And let's look at some of these cosmopolitan species. Um, the mulberry, uh, you know, this was planted, a hot plant in the 1820s when America thought we could compete with China. For silk production, that didn't work out so well. But uh, the mulberry tree is a legacy of uh, that period of time, the 1820s, and it's now ubiquitous as a spontaneous plant in the Northeast. And, you know, the kudzu vine, we don't have that in the Northeast, but, you know, you're familiar with it if you're from the South or you've been to the South. Uh, you know, it's got a terrible reputation, but what people fail to realize is that 13 million kudzu plants were actually planted, subsidized by uh, state and federal government for erosion control purposes. So, yes, uh, it's a it's a it's a uh, you know a bad plant, but uh, we actually planted it. So when you think about these invasive species, they're not just biological problems. There was a policy that called for planting this plant. So there's there's a sociological component to the invasive species issue that a lot of biologists don't want to admit to. It's not just you know bad plants versus good plants. It's no actually there's good policy and not so good policy. So there's, a, you know, kudzu was planted as a result of a, you know, government program, uh, mainly along railroad rights of way. Um, you know, other species that are ubiquitous, the robinia, which, you know, on the top shows a, a stand of robinia uncut, and then you cut it and it root suckers like crazy. This is the native range of robinia before farmers started planting it in the early 1800s. And, uh, you know, it's an incredibly useful plant because it produces this rot resistant wood that can be used for, you know, fence posts and, you know, any kind of um, wood that has comes in contact with the ground. All the mine timbers in this Appalachian Mountains coal mining are built out of Robinia. So this was a, you know, this was a gift from heaven as far as the farmers were concerned because the post could last 20 or 30 years in the soil. This is the real range of Robinia pseudoacacia. You know, so yes, you can harken back to where it was, you know, before 1800, but the world has changed. And so, yes, that's an interesting historical frame of reference to think about Robinia, but in fact, it's incredibly common in Europe and in Asia. So, you know, uh, talking about restoring uh, the native ecosystem or removing Robinia because it wasn't native when the pilgrims landed, I think is crazy. Uh, you know, the world has changed and there is no going back in time. Uh, or let's look at another one, Japanese knotweed. You're all familiar with this, obviously. Uh, you know, this was a hot plant in the 1860s. Uh, William Robinson, the inspiration for Frederick Law Olmsted, a lot of his work. Um, he loved the plant and, uh, you know, eventually he sort of disowned it. He said it was too aggressive, but the first editions of his uh, book, early editions, he was a, a big fan of it. And uh, of course, it's incredibly aggressive and dominates landscapes where it grows. And I'm not saying that, you know, it's, it's not a bad plant. It really depends on the context in which it's growing. Here it is along the White River uh, in Vermont, uh, was sort of part of the, um, a much larger ecosystem. But then in 2000, and uh, I think it was, um, I would say 13, uh, there was a hurricane that came through and uh, essentially wiped out, uh, scoured the White River Basin, wiped out most of the native vegetation, but the Japanese knotweed, because it's got a very deep tap root, uh, essentially was able to survive. And now both banks of the White River Junction from much White River, are, from much of its length, are dominated by uh, Japanese knotweed. So this is a really serious ecological problem that the state now faces. So, you know, there's no doubt that some of these plants have some, you know, can be very destructive. But in an urban context, I think the situation is a little bit more nuanced than that. Oh, there it is, Hurricane Irene in 2011. I said, 2013, but that was, uh, I think, a couple of years before um, Hurricane Sandy, or, you know, Pyrus, uh, the Bradford pear, it was considered this perfect street tree, you know, for a good 30 years, of millions of them were planted across North America, and then, uh, you know, lo and behold, it starts spreading away from its, uh, you know, commercial plantation into the woods and 
oh my God, a new invasive species is born. But again, you know, we have to acknowledge the sociological component to the spread of uh, the calorie pair. Or, you know, Phragmitis, this is uh, the New Jersey Turnpike, the, um, I think this is the Vince Lombardi exit near there. You know, you could look at this landscape and you say, oh my God, it's an incredible mess, but, you know, we got to clean it up and get it back to where it once was, restore it. But you could also say that there's a, over, a, you know, a history of over 500 landfills in this uh, New Jersey Meadowlands and that the Phragmitis, even though it's not native, is helping clean up the mess by absorbing nitrogen and phosphorus. And, you know, yes, you could restore this salt meadow cord grass that used to dominate the Meadowlands. It would actually be pretty simple. All you do is remove the New Jersey Turnpike and restore the tidal flow, you know, tidal flow to that area and you'll get that salt meadow cord grass back. But as long as that turnpike is there, it impedes the tidal flow and what you get is Phragmitis. So a lot of these uh, so-called invasive species are really, they're, they're symptoms of environmental degradation. They are not necessarily the causes of it. And, you know, Charles Darwin recognized that, um, you know, this is a, actually, it's an evolutionary process, not just ecology, but over time, evolution, you know, ecology becomes evolution. And, you know, one famous study has shown that actually the invasive species are not distributed randomly across the planet, that there's a sort of a asymmetry and that agricultural uh, and weeds and uh, weeds disturb habitats uh, originate mostly in Europe and have spread into Eastern North America and Eastern Asia, whereas forest species from Eastern Asia have invaded asymmetrically the forests of Eastern North America and meadows from Eastern North America, that would be, you know, the Great Plains have selectively invaded Eastern Asia and, and Europe. So, you know, this is evolution that's happening. It's not just, you know, um, something that you know, has real evolutionary implications. And this is, I think, really what we need to focus on. It's not about restoring, you know, what used to be here. We really have to own up to what's happening in the real world. And what are we going to do about it? how can we sort of uh, change this, this thing to work for us in, in the future, change this dynamic. And of course, you know, I hate making predictions, but here they are. You know, if you begin to look at you know, the forests over time, these are the trends that are happening, you know, on a large scale throughout the East Coast. Vines are, you know, becoming much more dominant. And of course, pests and pathogens, uh, you know, are also becoming increasingly uh, players in, in sort of reshaping our forests. They're taking out, you know, whole species. Think about the emerald ash borer, you know, what, how our forests are going to look once all those ash trees are removed. And, you know, the vines are incredibly destructive. If you want trees, you pretty much have to get rid of vines. This is bittersweet. You all know about bittersweet. And, you know, but what's interesting is, you know, as I said, it's, there's a sociological component to the invasive species issue. And, you know, if you really want to control in, invasive woody plants, you pretty much have to use herbicides. Now, maybe in the, in the rural areas, you can get away with using herbicides. People don't pay much attention to it, but in a, in a suburban, and a urban area, people are tuned into herbicides. They hate the use of herbicides. And if you actually ask people whether they'd rather have the invasive species or, you know, use herbicides, many people will tell you they, they'd just as soon have the uh, invasive species. So, you know, this is not just a biological issue. It's really a, uh, there's a huge sociological component. So the issue then becomes, how do you deal with these, uh, these novel ecosystems? as opposed to just wiping them out and saying, we're gonna, you know, restore what was here, is you begin to, uh, you know, the process is called intaglio, which is design uh, by removal rather than insertion. So it's the difference between editing a, an article and writing one. And, you know, these, so these novel ecosystems, what, you know, horticulturists of the future really have to learn to do is how do you manipulate these, um, you know, these landscapes to increase their ecological and their aesthetic characteristics, so removing high climbing vines, diseased or damaged trees, trees that are unhealthy or uh, unfriendly to people, unsightly or aggressive plants that uh, may be perceived as an indicator of dereliction or neglect. 
So it's not about eliminating novel ecosystems, but how do we, uh, you know, manipulate them to increase their aesthetic and ecological functionality. And, uh, you know, if done right, it can actually be, uh, you know, pretty remarkable. This is a landscape um, at the Arnold Arboretum, uh, of all places, a, a 24 acre site that was essentially a abandoned uh, urban infrastructure that is a, uh, now I call it urban nature, but minimal intervention. And this is my last slide, of course. And so, um, let's, uh, I'm sure they're going to put this on my tombstone. Uh, you know, what we <laughs> adapt or die, that is really, you know, uh, the, the challenge that we face now, not only from an ecological point of view, but you know, we humans, uh, you know, that's something we, we can learn from uh, the vegetation that's around us. So thank you very much for your attention. And I think I can uh, stop my screen share and uh, we can go to speaker view. And I guess, uh, Nina, you, I went over a little bit longer than I was supposed to, but um, uh, do we have time for some questions? Yeah, well, there's some questions on chat here. Thank you so much, Peter. Always fascinating to hear. Well, uh, uh, okay, well, how much was one question is how much sulfur is being deposited? How much what? Sulfur. As opposed to the nitrogen? I guess. I'm not so, sure about the sulfur. The, the, my friend was doing the study was looking exclusively at the nitrogen. So I would have to uh, go back and do a little mm. bit of research to get into the sulfur question. Uh, there's another question from Marvin Pritz. In the early 1900s, New York was only 10% forested due to logging. Today, they estimate the state is about 55% forested. But how much of this 55% would you say is fragmentized, cosmopolitan, urban forest, or not secondary forested ecosystems? Well, again, that's, um, you know, the satellite imagery is really, um, plays a big uh, role in, in answering that. And this whole, what's interesting is that this, when they identified this process of perforation, and this was now about, oh, maybe 10 years ago or 12 years ago, uh, all of a sudden the amount of intact forest, you know, dropped by, I, you know, I think it was like three or 4% uh, once they were able to actually recognize it. So, um, I think that's why I said that, that very early that you, if you have 30, you know, if you can, you know, impervious surface is something you can get off GIS very easily. So that is a surrogate for essentially a uh, novel urban, that's urbanization from an ecological point of view. So if you were able to generate a impervious surface map of an area, that would probably give you a pretty good idea of how much of the landscape was actually dominated by a, a novel ecosystem. Yeah, that's, um, and I also say fantastic presentation from somebody. So um, I guess that's about it for our questions. All right. And uh, I'd really say thank you. And we are, we have recorded it so that uh, all that information will be available in uh, one of the SIPs portals. So thank you, Peter. It's been a pleasure. Well, thank the you, book. Nina. It's, it's always great to uh, come to Cornell, even virtually. And, uh, you know, <laughs> Deliver the message. World. Right. Brave New World. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Bye-bye. Yeah. Okay. Bye-bye. This has been a production of Cornell University. On the web at cornell.edu.